Hey everyone, uh, we are here for our next session, which is around crypto as a hedge against global hyperinflation. Um, would you guys mind introducing yourself? Yeah, hi, um, I'm Stephen McClurg. I'll be I'll be moderating this panel, and uh, um, I'll turn over to Mark. Martin. I'm I'm Martin, uh, Chief Client Officer of Signum Bank. Signum Bank is the world's first digital asset bank to that today based in Switzerland and Singapore, serving primarily institutional clients. Hey, I'm Mona. Um, I'm currently um, co-founder -found, uh, and uh, CEO of Avangard uh, Finance. We're uh, one of the lead developers, researchers and developers for uh, the Enzyme Protocol, which was formerly known as the Melon Protocol, building uh, the one of the first builders in DeFi, building an on-chain asset management infrastructure. Um, and prior to that, I spent most of my career in traditional finance as a trader, market maker, nearly 10 years at Goldman and four years in portfolio management. Yeah. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Ilya Volkov. I'm a CEO and co-founder of Uhodler, a fintech platform focused on crypto-backed lending and other crypto-to-fiat services. And uh, in addition to the, that, uh, I'm um, the Crypto Valley Association Western Chapter Chair here in Switzerland. Great. Well, thank you, everybody. Um, we're going to start off by talking about inflation, and uh, uh, and then that will lead to hyperinflation. So, so the first question is, what is what is hyperinflation? Uh, what examples of of it have we seen in the past? And uh, where are we starting to see inflation creep in, despite the fact that we don't have real wage growth, which is usually a, uh, a, a one factor that prevents inflation. So, if I may, so uh, hyperinflation is a word many economists have thrown around lately. So, hyperinflation is a term to describe rapid, excessive, and out of control general price increases in the economy. So, typically, uh, if I'm not mistaken, measuring more than 50% per month, right? So, uh, why we're speaking about, about hyperinflation now? Uh, I guess just because uh, uh, due to COVID 19, and not only global banks have initiated money printing measures, uh, which uh, is resulting in the rapid increase of monetary base, all right? So 6.5 trillion was uh, injected in the US last year and Biden just announced a new one. Uh, it's uh, something like 1.9 trillion uh, additionally, right? Yeah, I mean, you know, we have so, so, so on the topic of, of, of hyperinflation or, or, or inflation in general, uh, the Fed has added $3 trillion to its balance sheet in the last year. So uh, a year ago, there was $3.8 trillion. Today, there's $6.8 trillion. Um, what have we seen in the markets that, uh, that 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 help to um, uh, drive inflation or, or hyperinflation um, uh, globally. I mean, also absolutely. I think what what the Fed is doing is um, is for sure also leading to inflation. No longer only in the hyperinflation countries that, that we all know, like uh, Venezuela and the likes, but it also will also lead probably in the long term to to inflation for more uh, developed uh, countries. Um, and and as you mentioned, I think there is a certain asset type that probably, they are not so much impacted by, by the inflation, but what you see is that some, some asset classes, like for example, real estate um, and, and commodities, they are quite significantly impacted by, um, by this inflation already today. And personally, I expect this trend to continue over the next couple of years. And I think um, here, and that's then the other topic probably later on discussed here cryptocurrencies they offer one quite attractive possibility to diversify and hedge against these kinds of hyperinflation and i think that's also what we now see that um well u.s corporate treasury start to realize but also institutional investors start to realize but i think on the institutional side we are still at the very very beginning yeah. so mona i'm curious you know this we're, we're, we're looking at inflation potential hyperinflation 
what effect does this have on the crypto markets, on the on on the invention of DeFi, on uh, or, or or even CFI markets? I think it's really interesting at the moment. Um, what, you, you know, I think you just came off a panel on stable coins, um, but I I I I think that. The world of stable coins is really fueling a lot of the DeFi growth right now. Borrowing and lending markets, the ability to, I mean, if you if you if you just take a very simple example, I live in Switzerland. I've just been notified by my bank that in June, starting in June, interest rates are going to go even more negative than they already are, and I'm, I'm getting warned by my banker that you know having cash in my bank account is a bad idea. He doesn't know I'm in DeFi, obviously, and I'm thinking, why do I have any cash at all when I can have stable coins earning me 10 to 15 percent yield per annum um, and potentially like a lot of other interesting things happening? And that's that's not taking much risk. I mean, OK, sure, there's a little bit of smart contract risk, but there, there that's not taking, you know, anywhere near as much risk if you could that you could take in DeFi if you sort of ramped up the risk factors took a little bit of leverage or did something else, you know, the returns could be much, much better. So I think that we're starting to see, um, you know, the, the explosion of DeFi, I think it's gone from 1 billion total value locked to 40 billion as of yesterday in the last six or seven months. And that's that's not happening for no reason. I mean, people are, people are tired of not um, being able to preserve the capital that they work hard for. And I think that it's 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 just clear to me that um, the the money moving into crypto is um, a direct reflection of uh, the, the the quality and the, the the properties that crypto has that fiat currencies and some other asset classes in traditional finance no longer have anymore. So, what, where do you think where do you think institutional investors are going to go? You know, look. Interest rates are extremely low, even though 10-year treasuries have just spiked up. I personally believe that they're going to go negative. Um, I think this is a, a short consolidation phase, but U.S. rates will come down, potentially go negative. Uh, a lot of European rates are already negative. Other rates around the world are negative. Um, where, where do you think institutional investors are going to go to get the returns that they need for their pension clients that require six to eight percent for their insurance clients that require five to seven percent um you know they're not just going to pile into bitcoin they're not just going to pile into DeFi, something that they don't know about but um uh are you starting to see interest uh what what, what assets uh, are they are they really going to start i kind of disagree with you there i mean i i think piling in is a strong word right but um i think that at this point, if crypto is not part of your portfolio construction, um, then you're missing, you know, you're missing out on something big here. Um, you know, it's not like crypto is new anymore. Bitcoin is like 12 years old now. Um, it's a mature, much more mature market than some of the other cryptos. I'll give you that. But as a pension fund, why shouldn't you have some allocation? Are we still arguing whether it's a valid crypto class or not? Because 40 billion, just the DeFi subsector of crypto is now larger than the entire cap bond market at 35 billion. So, you know, we can still be having this discussion about is crypto a valid asset class? It, it, is, a, it is an asset class, that's a fact by now. The question is how, you know, the question pension funds have to solve is how do, uh, how much of it, you know, can they, how much of it should, should, should they be taking as part of their portfolio construction? That's a question for people smarter than me who are focused on portfolio construction and risk analytics to, to, to take care of. I think you're muted, Martin. I, don't know if you're... I think what we observe really that, I mean, institutional investors, they are forced to decrease their fixed income basket, right? Now the question is, where do the fixed income basket, where does it go? And um, as Mona Lisa also mentioned, yes, maybe, a small part of the allocation today goes into crypto. I think probably in the next couple of months, we also see that some um, of this money is going into DeFi, also from institutional players, even though the discussion that we have with institutional players, they are still a bit reluctant. Exactly. They don't understand smart contract risk or they want to ensure smart contract risk. I think there are many things um, growing there in the ecosystem, which makes them more comfortable and will make them more comfortable over the next couple of months to really also put institutional money 
uh, into into these DeFi pools. But I think like today, um, now outside of uh, of the world, we also see that some of the speaks combos is being allocated to more traditional asset class like equities, for example. But for sure. And here I fully agree with Mona Lisa. Um, like we really need to allocate part of the portfolio to crypto, and I think that's also what's now currently being observed by institutional clients. Yeah, Ilya, do you have any uh, any any thoughts on that? Uh, I had some thoughts mostly from retail investors' point of view, I guess. So. Uh, if you'd like, if we speak about uh, retail investors, uh, I see at least three uh, real use cases how, how crypto could, could help us uh, with combating hyperinflation, potential hyperinflation. So, um, uh, so if you'd like, uh, so the first one is gold, actually. So if this disaster scenario, disaster hyperinflation scenario plays out and, and fiat currency becomes completely worthless, uh then it's of course up to society to find a new currency right and gold could be a good option traditionally uh so gold is a stable asset that holds its value very well uh in comparison to fiat currencies like dollar or euro so but uh, one large downside uh, to gold is the physical nature of it so it's not convenient to carry out uh, to carry around uh, large amounts of gold so uh, and crypto here brings uh, very nice opportunity. So um, that's why stable coins like like Pax Gold, for example, uh, could be very interesting in terms of uh, combating hyperinflation. And actually, uh, today we've got a very very good news. Um, uh, Seba Bank in Switzerland just announced that they are starting to uh, starting the the, the project uh, around uh, building their gold token. So which is really good because they're regulated banking institution uh, in trusted jurisdiction. So yeah, so first option is gold. And by the way, I think uh, it should be a good option for institutional uh, investors as well. So yeah, that's great. Um, well, you know, Mona, you, make, you, you brought up a really good point. And, uh, and, and, and I believe that not only not not only are when I, when I say institutions, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm talking about pensions and sovereign wealth funds and insurance companies, but you also have, uh, you know, others, uh, including corporations that are adding Bitcoin to their balance sheet uh, to transact in a digital economy as opposed to, um, you know, uh, traditional economies. Um, where do you think uh, where do you think these larger investors are going to go uh, that, that, are, that are outside of retail? Is it, you know, it's, it, it looks like it's Bitcoin for now. Uh, is it going to be in some of these other uh, altcoins or, or protocol tokens or, or, or other DeFi uh, type activities? I think um, altcoins will always be, in, I mean, I, th I think it's going to be a, 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 a wide range of all of those things. Basically, I think, um we're still evolving DeFi is still evolving i wouldn't say it's a mature market yet um a year ago we didn't have things like derivatives options uh synthetics or at least we didn't have any volume in them now we have like you know now a year ago we were trying to figure out as an asset management infrastructure how to drive liquidity on dexes <laughs> you know and now a year later you know there are days where dexes trade more liquidity than centralized exchanges so I think that the speed at which things is move, are moving is insane right now in decentralized finance. And also the pop I just explained from a billion to 40 billion in six months just gives you a sense of how money is moving in and how uh, different opportunities are arising. Um, I think that what we will see is a replication. Of, so I don't think people are in reinventing the what uh, the, the, the 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 financial instruments we're seeing the financial tool uh, you know products we're seeing look quite similar to those that you see in traditional finance you know you're seeing people building things that look like things you see in traditional finance like derivatives like options like synthetics like futures like leverage tokens like whatever but the how is where the innovation is really happening you know you're building these products in a way where there is nothing, there's no one in the middle, 
there's, uh, except for the only thing that exists between the financial participants is the smart contract. In most cases, uh, all participants have full custody at all times. So it's a completely non-custodial uh, system. And that, that gives it um, a bunch of new properties, um, secure properties, um, that you wouldn't have in traditional finance. Like you never have to, you know, even if I invest in a D5 vault that's yielding 35% per annum, I have full autonomy, full control over my assets at all time with that token. I can redeem it instantaneously for the underlying assets at any moment. Um, if I make a, a loan to Martin on, um, you know, if I make a, a loan on Compound, I don't need to know the borrower. I don't need to have a bank in the middle to assess the 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 the, the credit, you know, the credit rating of the borrower, etc. I don't need to have uh, someone making sure that the payments arrive on time. The smart contracts are doing that all for us, um, and the blockchain is um, making sure that those payments are, you know, made back to the lender on time. Um, so. So the, the 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 for me it's just it's just like as the market matures you're going to see more and more products that look similar to what you see in traditional finance in terms of products but the real innovation is how um, these products are are working you know they because they're digital they operate uh, they, there's a lot more transparency there's a lot more uh, self custody there's a lot more control. Uh, there's a lot uh, less censorship and there's a lot more um, interesting, cool things you can do like risk management, operations, administration, um, uh, reporting, uh, stuff that you can do, which you would, uh, you, 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 you really frankly struggle with even in traditional finance, even if you're a super large organization. By the way, the Fed recently wrote a great paper on DeFi uh, and it was published recently and it was nice to see that they were so optimistic about the use cases and um, the opportunities that DeFi could open. Speaking of, uh, what, what are the current DeFi opportunities out there that, that, that each of you like, uh, you know, and tell me why it's so interesting, you know, in, in, in addition to what we've already talked about. Um, and also, as if interest rates go lower or even become negative, um, how might you mitigate that with DeFi? So, uh, do you remember, guys, about uh, crypto, not the crypto, carry trade strategy from the past? Um, um, if you remember, um, uh, it's it's a traditional strategy when using low yielding currency to fund a high yielding investment, uh, you you can you can make some profits. For example, take a look back at uh, twenty uh, two thousand four two thousand eight. Um, uh, interest rates on, uh, in Japan were down near like 0.5% and not moving. And meanwhile, the Federal Reserve in the USA boosted rates from 1% up to like 5 or 6%. So investors then borrowed yen to fund their dollar-based investments. And uh, then uh, the yen weakened 20% against the dollar and large profits were made. So while the carry trade is not nearly as popular today in traditional markets, it's it's in my mind it's finding a new, a new breath, breath of fresh air in crypto. Like you can you can borrow cheap cheap fiat and invest it in DeFi or uh, invest it in, in CFI with um, uh, crypto interest accounts. So I think again, so um, uh, many answers to the ch challenges of the present time or uh, the future lie in the past. So. And uh, this carry trade strategy is, is a great example in my mind. Uh, I mean, in, in my view, um, and, and here fully in line with, with Mona, I think like, for example, just DeFi lending is like, it's really a game changer because you can put your money to work. You don't no longer need a financial institution. You no longer need to trust anyone except the blockchain and probably, well, and this is probably a systematic risk that some, some institutions are, are a bit afraid of. You probably also need to trust the underlying stable coin. That's probably today quite a hindering factor why some of the institutional money is also still on the side because they say, I also have the risk of the, the stable coin itself. Of course, if, if this underlying loses value uh, against the US dollar, for example, I cannot redeem it one to one. Uh, this is a risk I'm currently taking. It's probably quite a tail risk, but a tail risk which is, is, is quite significant. But for me, 
like just DeFi lending itself is really a significant game change. And I think what we see, why uh, can the banks not pay attractive interest rates on the deposits is probably because they cannot make this money work efficiently for their customers and for the people who are long cash, right? And with DeFi, you have now direct immediate access. It's an open market. You see, is there more demand? API goes up. Is there less demand? API goes down. Um, and this alone is, is quite a significant game changer. And then, of course, I think in the next step, probably a bit more complex product, is exactly what we see like with the Uniswaps and the like, that we really can have these liquidity pools to exchange, uh, very efficiently exchange values between uh, different parties, always basically guaranteeing best execution by a smart contract, which is for sure also a game changer. But really the DeFi lending itself is, is an in, 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 unimaginable opportunity for all of us, like for, for retail, for institutional. Um, and I, I think that what we will see is the protocols are evolving, the, the pools are evolving, um, and we will probably see that we have a certain protocol which is primarily dedicated to, to institutional money, probably with some more safeguards than we see now in the retail space, but there will be products coming out which serve the institutional sector because there is money there and there is also play money there, probably not 10% of the allocation, but uh, you know, al already 0.5% of the allocation of institutional money is like very, very significant money. And this will come into this, this DeFi space. Uh, and I would say they start probably with DeFi lending. This would be my best guess. Yeah, I would probably agree with that. Um, I mean, it's probably the most safest and plain vanilla product that you could start with so i can imagine uh that would be the first place institutions start but i think you know what do i think is the most exciting depends where your risk appetite is to be honest um <laughs> if you you know if you wanted to um lend eth right now to leveraged borrowers you could you could be making 45 percent a year on your eth if you wanted to, but you know, obviously you have you have much higher risk if if for some reason, um, you know, just as an example, if prices fall too fast for the system to you know to work as it should work, you know, could you 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 could be in trouble. I would say there there's there's definitely risks associated, but um, but you know, we're seeing just so many innovative, cool things, you know. Uh, I've, I've, as a previous market maker, I'm a little bit more hesitant on AMM pools because of the impermanent losses, although you're starting to see much more smarter market making uh, algorithm. Like, I guess like as a, maybe I'm traditional, but I, I always feel if you're providing uh, the capital, if you're providing liquidity, then you're the one taking the risk. So therefore you should have the upside if um, a trade goes the right way. And in, in the traditional AMM, model at least the constant product formula model you tend to see that uh it's the arbitrageurs getting all the upside and um and not the lp you know the, the liquidity providers so we're starting to see that evolve with dynamic market making paper loy lu just put out for example this week or uh some more innovative um innovative is is not fair actually because the original con you know the original concept of an amm pool was extremely innovative but you're starting to see kind of smarter formulas evolve uh which which um start to price things more fairly and i think uh reward people who provide liquidity in in a with more of the upside which is more fair so i, th I think there's just tons of things that are super liquid farming and liquidity incentives are really exciting right now people are starting to use their own tokens as a as a way to um as a way to incentivize liquidity providers um you know whether those liquidity incentives make sense or not i guess it doesn't really matter at this stage people you know they're there and they're worth something and people are you know are taking the opportunities and i think there's a lot of exciting stuff but a lot of it depends on the risk appetite you have <laughs> someone was asking about the fed paper so i'll just link to it here <laughs> Um, well, on that, uh, we're, we're, we're coming out at, at the end of the time. Uh, I'd like to give each panelist a time for any final closing thoughts. I think if you're not in DeFi or you haven't played around with it, it's just such a fascinating space. Like instead of listening to panels like this, just 
get a MetaMask wallet set up and try it yourself. Yeah, so this panel was about hyperinflation. So I personally think that sooner or, or later we will see inflation and then hyperinflation. And um, uh, we will need to find some, some new way to, to work with our funds, with our investments. And I believe that crypto could be a really good option. And uh, so we, we, we see many of different opportunities to use crypto as a tool to, to fight hyperinflation. So like uh, we can use this um, uh, tokenized asset like, like gold, we can use different trading strategies. Uh, we, can, we can use uh, crypto loans uh, and other uh, solutions like that. And uh, also uh, tokenization of assets could, could help us uh, in creation of new type of uh, uh, assets, new type of money probably. So like, uh, let's take a look into NFTs. Um, it's something new. NFT are driving a new wave of crypto adoption. And I think it could be a new way to, to deal with uh, hyperinflation. So, yeah, I, I, I personally believe that crypto is a great tool to, to deal with uh, inflation, hyperinflation. I think also like the audience had the question, like how much did we talk about hyperinflation? I think um, DeFi itself is of course a very interesting yield generating possibility. But it's probably not the one measure against hyperinflation for me and that's probably also the institution perception today uh, if you want to protect against hyperinflation then probably uh, gold or uh, the bitcoin itself is the one investment good which protects you against uh, hyperinflation or inflation um, and i think on this one um we need to be a bit careful when, when we talk about inflation because it's um always when, when the official inflation rate is published by, by, by the governments and institutions, it, it's a bit difficult to say what is in this basket. For example, in Switzerland, uh, real estate is not included in this basket and real estate increased like significantly in, in, in prices over the last couple of years. And I give you a simple example. Porsche, uh, Porsche 911 uh, was about uh, 10,000 US dollars in, in 1968, right? To, today it's 150K, so inflation is real. And I think this the very simple feature of bitcoin that it's limited is actually a, a very nice thing especially if you don't think in in months and years but if you think in decades right so if if you have the problem that you say how do i put away money for the next generation then to put 10 bitcoins is for sure significantly cleverer than putting 500,000k into a safe because it, it will not be much worth in in 10 years or, or or in 20 years when the next generation wants to spend the money so for me, the one investment good to protect against inflation today in the digital asset space is Bitcoin. In the traditional space, it's equities and gold. Martin, I, I like your very Swiss Porsche 911 example. It's Porsche 911 index. Very good way to explain the inflation. <laughs> exactly. Well, hey, uh, I you know really appreciate everybody um, uh, being here today. Uh, thank you for everybody watching and uh, uh, time to time to end. Thank you all. Thanks thank again. You. This is great. We're going to transition to our next session.